Do you think we've said blowing trumpets too many times for a podcast? Trumpet. <laughs> <laughs> You're listening to Widowed Air with Rosie Gilmoss and Lucinda Boast. We've invited some members of the world's most exclusive club to bravely share their stories. Join us for some honest conversations about living a different life, the crushing lows, the surprising highs and everything in between. Please note this is a podcast about death. Carefully read the episode descriptions and be kind to yourself. But for now, welcome to our podcast. Let us begin. Hello and welcome back to Widowed AF. You're with me, Rosie Gilmoss, and the lovely Lulu. Hi, Lulu. Hello. You okay? Yeah, I'm really well. It's lovely to see your face today. Not that anybody else can, but I can hear you. (laughs) (laughs) This is starting off well. Right. (laughs) So today we're going to be talking a little bit about Julie's episode, which we heard on Monday. It'd be really interesting to hear your take having listened back to it. And then we're going to have a little bit of chat about our weeks. So what were your thoughts on Julie's episode? Because you don't know her personally like I do, do you? No, I've never met Julie, but I love her already. She's she's firmly now one of my tribe, as I know she is yours. But yeah, her episode actually really, really moved me in lots of ways. Not only the nature of, of Fraser's death, her daughter's reaction when she told her and she said, not my daddy. That was just going around and around in my head, as well as you know the sheer nature of of Fraser's death. I I can't actually imagine the shock and some of the horrible thoughts that Julie must have to face every day. Yeah, it was when she was talking about how far he'd fallen and that sort of you know the awful intrusive questions that you have. I mean, you must have experienced this yourself, Lou. I know I certainly have. And you almost create a picture that is so much worse. I mean, is it worse? I don't know. But you create this image in your head. And we've heard other people talk about it, haven't they? And why they've ended up having to tell their children quite often, kind of quite gruesome facts, because the truth isn't as bad as what they maybe have constructed in their minds. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I know... At the time, I was going on, you know, after losing John, I went on a fact-finding mission. I wanted all of the information, not realising that, putting it in my brain was going to cause me trauma further down the line. I think Julie did this as well, asking lots and lots of questions. And for instance, I read my husband's post-mortem report, which was shocking and horrific. And why did I do that? But we're very strong in those early hours and days after losing our loved ones. Something comes over us, I'm sure. Yeah. And I'm, I mean, that's kind of how my brain works as well. I like to know everything. And it's one of the things I've really struggled with, with Ben's death is not knowing. And I don't suppose I ever will, really, because there's a very little chance he'll ever be found. So you have to make peace with that. And I think for Julie as well, because, of course, all these awful images in her head, you know, the, the, even, you know, we can all kind of gruesomely imagine what it looks like to fall that far. And it's, it's horrible. And that's that stuck with her. I think that resonated with me as well. I kind of I kept, you know, sort of ooh, almost kind of, you know, shuddering with the, the thought of it. We must have done. And actually, I know that there are so many similarities between Fraser's story and Ben's story. And that must have been really hard for you to listen to to Julie talking. And there were so many moments where I saw your face, that recognition in your eyes. And how do you feel about that now? Yeah, to be honest, it was it was one of the harder ones we've done. Just I could, so much of what she said was kind of took me right back into that place. You know, the waiting, not knowing. And, and even the idea that he was doing this kind of this extreme sport that he loved and much like me Julie kind of didn't you, you always when you have a partner that does these things you always forget they're quite dangerous and yeah the bargaining and the coming up with the ideas of you know he, it might be this it might be this oh it's probably just this all that all that bargaining that goes on I mean it's it's a it's very common in with our guests isn't it whether it be a when they receive a terminal diagnosis or when they get this catastrophic news we do almost start to bargain with a god that many of us don't even believe in we you, you start to grab at any, anything don't you you do you just switch into survival mode you start fluffing the cushions when you see the police coming up the path <laughs> yeah. at one in the morning knowing that they're not delivering good news but you know let's put your lippy on yeah exactly <laughs> it's like the vicar coming round for tea or something ridiculous but yeah I definitely heard that in Julie's voice it took her a long time to actually absorb what they were saying to her yeah and it's it was really and I use the word inspiring a lot but but all of our guests are it would be you know I'd do them an injustice not to and the way she sort of I mean she has a blog called and I think it's something called 
grabbing life by the vag. I will check and I will link to it. And I just think if that sums her up, really. It's that kind of, okay, this catastrophic, awful thing has happened, but I'm still here. I'm still here and I want my life. And you can hear that in the, this kind of determined way she's she's raised her child and, and you know, she's got a new partner and I love a, a good love story at the end of all this. So, you know, I, really, I found it a really, you know, a really enjoyable, kind of feels like the wrong word, but I really enjoyed talking to her and I feel I learned a lot about her. Yeah, it's ultimately, you know, it's uplifting the, the way that Julia's turned her life around. The fact she's writing a blog is wonderful. It's such a great outlet for people who have been through what we've been through. And she posts a lot on social media. She shares what she's up to, the good, the bad, the ugly. Um, and I really, really admire that. And I'm, I'm really a, a strong advocate for people doing that, for sharing their stories. You know, I used to be a really private person and I wouldn't share much on social media. And I felt some kind of shame in, in not... In, in talking openly on social media, I thought, oh, I'm never going to be one of those people. Yeah. But I'm one of those people now and, and my life's better for it. Yeah, I didn't even used to put my kids on, you know. I, and and then, well, actually, it was probably when Ben died that I lent quite heavily into social media. This, it, 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 so, you know, it, it isn't, it, it comes with its downfalls, we all know that, but it does have a a community purpose sometimes when something it like does. this happens. And then, I th and then I sort of felt like by demonstrating and showing the children and how we were sort of navigating through it, I would give people a little bit of an insight. But it was only really when I looked back through old Instagram posts and things and I thought, that isn't an insight into grief at all. That's not. That's a very carefully curated Instagram look at grief. And that's why I want this to be more. I want this to be to get into the root of it, to get into the core of what it means to be a widow in the or and I again I will reiterate I mean male or female, married or not married, in today's world. Absolutely. I mean, if we hadn't engaged on social media, we wouldn't have met. We wouldn't have met the friends that we've met. You wouldn't have met your husband. I wouldn't. You know? So it it's one of the really important tools for us widows, I think. I think particularly when you are widowed and you are very isolated. So often if you have children, you can't just go off to the gym or go walk the dog in the evening because you have the children. So social media becomes quite an important tool in your, your recovery and your healing. And I think also this was a hugely exacerbated during lockdown when lots of our people were stuck in a home alone or alone with, with children. And the isolation is very, very scary and, it, and that's you know, dangerous, as we know. So I think social media provided a huge support during that time. It did. And actually, in our journeys, it's helped us at various points to share, you know, highlights of important, significant dates. For example, I know that you had a big anniversary on Sunday. What has your week been like in, after that? Shit. <laughs> oh, right. <laughs> No, that's 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 a sweeping statement because it hasn't been completely rubbish. It's it hit me a, a hell of a lot harder than I expected to, if I'm honest with you. Five years, wasn't it? Yeah, it was five years, and I sort of thought that not that I would be over it because you're never going to be over it, but that I would be less, I suppose, less sideswiped by it. And I'm not going to lie to you because that's not in the spirit of what this is. I spent six hours staring at a wall wrecked with sobbing on Sunday and it's making my voice crack to think about it because it was very very scary and it was very reminiscent of five years ago. Now the only thing I can think that explains why I had such a visceral reaction is that this is my I, I, I lent quite heavily on alcohol and I also was prescribed antidepressants and I no longer have those crutches in my life so I can only assume that without those it's it just it was all very raw and and I had to do a lot of processing of pain that I maybe had avoided so yeah it's been it's been difficult it's left me a little bit jarred and tired I'm not going to lie but I got through it yeah I got through it and that that's the ultimate thing is everything passes everything and these horrible pits of despair that you still may find yourself going into they pass they do pass they do they I mean they become fewer and further between they become less intense but I know it took you by surprise that that Sunday affected you so much and you mustn't be disappointed that it did you know I know that you had all sorts of thoughts about what you wanted to do and we make these plans we think yes I'm going to go to that place I'm going to sing this song have this meal listen to this music but all you needed to do was lay down stare at a wall and sob yeah and, and that's I okay and I am very fortunate I'm aware of the privilege that I have because I have a, a, a 
and a live husband as well. And he's incredibly supportive. Most, most I suspect, because he's a wonderful man, but also he's a widower. So he understands that, that grief is a very peculiar. Um, and he, he, so I was able to do that. And I guess for the last however many years I wasn't because the children, I couldn't leave them at the time, you know, and go and stare at a wall for six hours because that's not fair. They needed me. And it, I, it's a common theme with almost every guest we have on who has children that your grief is often delayed. So it's something to be aware of. You are sort of in that early stage, and I don't want to be a doomsayer and saying, oh, you know, you're not done yet, but just be aware that you may not be done yet. No, absolutely one, not. One positive thing I wanted to mention, actually, and this is the support I got, because I'm quite, I, I, I'm not private in that I blurt out a vast amount of information at quite inappropriate times, but I'm not very good at saying when I feel vulnerable or asking for help. And over the weekend, when people asked me how I was and how I was managing, I told them. And I told them in all the gory, raw, ugly, crying truth. And I was met with so much love and support and kindness. And it kind of made me realise, actually, that if you do ask, and I'm not saying that at five years you can be weeping into the pillow and blaming everything on your grief, because you can't. That is the sad and honest truth of it. You cannot but you are still allowed to grieve and you are still allowed to have these crushing lows and people will understand. So I, I suppose that was something that I learned, actually. It just shows that you are still learning, even at, at the place we are in our, in our, in our I hate to use the word, journey, in our journey. <laughs> <laughs> I could see you not wanting to say it. <laughs> <laughs> My brain frantically searching for anything else that means journey. I've got loads now. <laughs> Oh, I know this is the thing. And people don't know how to support us down the line, do they? I mean, for instance, our, my five-year anniversary, I don't know if you remember this, but you asked me how I was in the morning. You messaged me and I said, I'm okay. <laughs> and you were like, no, you're not. And you turned up on my doorstep <laughs> as a surprise. <laughs> me <and Ta> <laughs> <laughs> yeah and you sent a picture you sent a selfie of you at my front door and said guess look where I am <laughs> yeah well we drove all the way there and I wanted it to be a surprise and then you went bloody in were you <laughs> <laughs> but we came home my house was an absolute state and you just sat down you weren't even looking at the state of the house you just wanted to see me and you couldn't be there long but you made that you know 90 mile journey yeah <laughs> just for me and yeah and it is, it's things like that that count, isn't it? Because you might only be able to go and see somebody for 20 minutes, half an hour. But sometimes that physical presence of seeing somebody that has made an effort because they love you just makes you feel so, I don't know, just reassured and that you're, what you're feeling is valid and real and that it's okay. And I do, I do think it's something really important. And it kind of prompted us to pull together a list of do's and don'ts for then freshly widowed, didn't it? Because we were thinking, what, you know, what, did we really need back then that maybe we didn't get and what did we not need that maybe we did get and it's I, I don't want anybody to think this is an attack on um the non-widowed community because it absolutely isn't that's not never my intention it is more that we've been asked on numerous occasions for, for suggestions of what people can do and it not I don't even mean widowed I mean bereaved people people who are grieving and so we've kind of pulled together a little list, which we'll drop onto social media and, and see what you guys think of it. And please let us know if you've got anything else to add. We're, we're not precious. We don't mind. We don't mind a little gentle critique. So, and you can let us know via Instagram or emails, or you can drop us a little voice note. No, definitely love to hear your thoughts on that. And actually, I read the list and could relate to all of those and agreed with them wholeheartedly. But it made me reflect because if somebody I know now is widowed, I think I would still hesitate to know what to do. Yeah. So it's a helpful reminder for all of us of the ways that we can support people, the helpful ways and the, the unhelpful things that we must avoid doing. <laughs> yeah, and, and, it, it, it's, and it's very easy to make a, a slip up. And, and I, also, I also want to caveat that with they're not going to be cross with you because we understand that you, you probably never experienced what we're experiencing. And to be honest, if you're not sure what to do, just do something and... It, even if it is just a text a couple of times a week or remembering the dates. I've got a couple of friends that have got the 12th of March or, and I have one that still messages them on the 12th of every month, which is so kind of her. And, and they, and it's just because it's, it's our very important date, but you can't expect other people to remember it. So if you're supporting, so just put that date in your calendar and then you won't forget. You might end up like me where I used to message a friend oh, like three days before every year, every month, I think it was. I mean, I, I, I don't know how I ended up doing that, but I'll unapologise. Becky, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> oh, 
Oh, no, I think it's really helpful to anyone in supporting somebody who's who's grieving, for sure. Yeah, I think people just genuinely don't know what to do. And, you know, we may not be formal experts in this, but we've certainly been to the University of Life on this subject, haven't we? Just by nature of talking to the many, many people we do and, and sharing these experiences, it's been one of the sort of surprising outcomes of this podcast, actually, is that we are building this wealth of knowledge and to be able to share it with people is, it's actually a gift, if that doesn't sound too cheesy. It, it really does feel like that sometimes. It does. It really does. Hearing the different stories and the different takes on experiences that that we've had in common, but we've responded to in different ways. Like Liz Towner, when she spoke about the people that crossed the street, and mm-hmm. it, she had a different take on that. And that opened mind, the different ways that people have dealt with their in-laws for example it's just really helpful f- for me and in helping other people too so it's great yeah and I, I am hearing a lot as well that people genuinely do want to ha- know what's best and they're so frightened of doing the wrong thing that they do nothing and actually that that's probably the worst thing we also probably should mention that our rocket to stardom um launched you know, we were on radio berkshire Today, we, this is Wednesday that we're recording, so we run Radio Berkshire today talking about the podcast. We were their podcast of the week, and that, that was really, really cool, wasn't it? We did it via Zoom rather than in the studio, but it's We exciting. did. Yes. <laughs> it was fun. We love any opportunities like that to, to come and talk about the stories that we're sharing because we are absolutely honoured to be sharing so many powerful stories. So, you know, to be invited onto the radio to talk about it mm. is incredible. We love it. And I don't think it's blowing our own trumpet either to say that we're pretty proud of this little little. We are. Read. We're blowing the trumpets of everyone who who's appeared on our podcast. You know, I, we're bigging you guys up too. We're so proud of everybody. Do you think we've said blowing trumpets too many times for a podcast? Trumpet. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, on that note, you enjoy all your trumpets thank you very much for listening everybody we will be back with you on monday we have a lovely lady called sarah who is going to talk us through the the loss of her husband and i won't give i won't give much away now actually because it's a very it's a, it's, a, it's another unique story so have a listen on monday thanks for joining us everybody goodbye why did i say goodbye like that <laughs> goodbye <laughs> Bye. <laughs> Thank you for listening today. We'll be back with you soon for more from the front line of loss. But for now, as you were. <laughs>